education. I just want to give a shout out to Venetia for being with us tonight. She actually was out sick from work today and is here with us tonight. And I'm so appreciative of her dedication um, because it really shows how much she cares that each one of you is able to have this time to answer, get, get answers to any questions that you have and have the opportunity just to, to get to know the University of Maryland better. So um, hats off to you, Venetia, and thanks so much. Um, I'm also really happy to have a couple of colleagues from the field office here as well. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have a team of folks who are gonna be working with each one of you, um, assuming that you're gonna come be part of our program, and I hope you will. Um, but we've got a team of folks who will work with you on your field placement experience. Um, and so I'm really pleased to have them. I see Denise Chop, who's one of our coordinators in the Baltimore region. I see Franklin Chapel, who's another coordinator in the Baltimore region. Denise works mostly with uh, folks who have an interest in families and children. Franklin works mostly with folks who have an interest in aging and health. Um, and then we have Angela Jakelski, who is our macro field coordinator. Um, I'll, I'll go over a little bit about what macro even means and then ask Angela to provide some details. Um, but um, that is to say that um, for all of you who are here this evening and interested in our program, I'm really pleased to have some folks from our field team here as well. Um, and of course, we have our Associate Dean for Admissions and Enrollment, Danielle White, who is always just a steadfast presence in pretty much everything we do at the University of Maryland. I feel like I see uh, Dean White everywhere, and she is a fantastic resource. So thanks for being here again, um, and as always. Um, you know, one of the things that I realize is knowing that you are all prospective students, um, you, you may know exactly what questions you have to ask. You may also not even know what questions you should ask. And so I thought one thing that might be helpful was just to start with a little bit of a presentation, not take too much time, but give you an overview of what we even mean when we talk about field education. What does that mean? Um, try to, to provide a little bit of information for you. And that may either answer some questions you already have, or at least give you a little more information from which you can come up with some additional questions to ask. Um, in which case I invite you to, to ask us at any time. And again, much thank, many thanks to um, our field coordinators who are with us this evening as well. So I'm gonna take just a second and share my screen because believe it or not, uh, those of us in this academic world love our PowerPoint slides. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see the PowerPoint slides? Yeah, okay. All right, so, um, you know, field education is a significant portion of the MSW program. And, and as such, it's kind of where those of us in field like to say, it's where the rubber hits the road. You're gonna be in classes and those classes are gonna give you a lot of really great information about theory, about, um, technique, about history, about policy, about all these things related to or directly relevant to social work. Field education is where you get to try most of that stuff out. And that's why it's such an important part of this program. If you're coming in um, to our program from the social services field, some things may feel pretty familiar, in which case the difference for you is going to be that being part of an MSW program and learning um, what it means to have that MSW degree is going to give you even more tools on your tool belt of, of tricks of the trade to work with your clients. Um, and then also learn where some of the limitations and necessary boundaries are in practice with vulnerable populations. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that I've heard a lot of students say when they come through the door and express an interest in the MSW is, hey, I've heard about field education. What is it? And I'm a little stressed out because I understand it's going to take a lot of time and that it's a huge part of the program. So one of the things I'm hoping to do this evening is answer that question about what field education is and how to apply once you come into the program and also to help you 
um, through that understanding, get a better idea of why field ed education is what is actually referred to by our accrediting body as a signature pedagogy of the degree. And, and it really is because field is where you are going to take what you learn in the classroom, try it out with real people in real agencies, um, but do it as a student, do it as a learner and have the opportunity to implement some of the techniques that you learn about, some of the theories that you learn about to actually use them with real people, get direct feedback from a practicing social worker in the field. And then likewise, bring those experiences back into the classroom where you'll have an opportunity to talk about those experiences, what you're learning from them, the things you've tried to apply about a certain technique and how it went. Um, so let me kind of jump in, if you'll, if you'll just bear with me for a couple of minutes, let me just jump into this presentation, get some of this sort of the nuts and bolts uh, information down for you, um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. So how to apply for a field placement. Um, so the first thing, as I mentioned, there's a team, okay? The, the Office of Field Education is a team of people who are all clinical uh, licensed social workers, not clinical, but licensed social workers. Angela is a licensed social worker in the macro field. So is Giselle Ferretto who is also on our team. Um, but for the most part, we have all been in practice. And then we've come back into this arena to pay it forward in terms of what a field experience should look like for somebody who's working to become an MSW. And so these are the names of all the people who are in our office. We work very closely together. Um, we work very collaboratively and we do view everything about field education for the most part as a partnership. We see you as adult learners coming into our program and partnering with us to access the best possible educational opportunities available out there. Um, and so we also need to be organized. And one of the ways that we organize ourselves is by region because our program it has field placements throughout the state and even into Virginia, into Washington, DC, even up into Delaware, um, where most of our placements are pretty much within and around the Baltimore area or within and around the DC metro area. We also have placements that extend beyond there. And so this is a listing of, again, the names of our field coordinators and the regions that they work with most closely. So if you are part of our, our info session tonight and you know that you are from Frederick County, then most likely you're gonna be working with Denise Chop, who's also here with us this evening. You might also be interested in, um, or you're applying to our uh, Shady Grove campus, which is the same program. It's just a little smaller, located in a different place and has a real focus in the curriculum on families and children and behavioral health. But regardless, like I said, we all work very, very closely together. And so um, this gives you an idea of who covers which counties. So if you're coming to us as a foundation student, it'll give you the name of the person who you will most likely work with when you come into the program. Um, dates to keep in mind. Yes, that is an important thing. So when you come into the program, um, you know, you know that you're going to be starting classes in August and you'll stay in classes until the end of April or beginning of May. Field education happens on almost the same schedule, except that we often start about a week to maybe two weeks after classes start. And then we actually end a little bit earlier than when classes end. So you can estimate roughly the beginning of September until about mid towards late April of the following spring. That is the field academic year. It's also really important to remember that though field is also, it's, it's an internship, it's also a class. And so when you go in and you register for classes and you plan to be in field education, you need to make sure that you register for it. That's really, really important. So if you're coming in in the first year of foundation year, you want to make sure that you register for SOWK 635. 
Um, and then ignore the date. Sorry about that. I could have updated it. Missed that. If you're coming in, for example, as an advanced standing student, someone who's already had a year and you're going to be coming in and entering into advanced field education, then you're going to want to make sure that you register for either um, the clinical, which is SWCL 794, which is the class that is the clinical advanced field, or the macro, which is SWOA 794, um, if you're an advanced macro student. So make sure that you don't forget to register. We correspond with our registration office all the time, but we want to make sure that it, nothing slips through the cracks. So make sure you do that. Another thing that's really important, if you are still thinking about whether you're going to come to our program or you recently um, confirmed your acceptance of our offer of admission, um, do your field application as soon as you can. I know that you've probably gotten correspondence from our admissions letting you know that the field application is due a couple of weeks after you confirm your admission. Please do that. And the reason why is that the sooner you give us your field application, which is a separate process than your application to the program, the sooner then our coordinators can take a look at your application, read through it, sort through all the different details that are involved in terms of facilitating a field placement, and then be available to you for any questions you might have in particular about your placement, um, in particular about placement availability within the area you live, or any other questions that you might have. So getting that application in is going to be really important. And I will actually walk you through how to access the application if you haven't done it, so that the screens look familiar to you um, in just a minute. And then the other thing I think in terms of dates to keep in mind is we will be offering um, and it is required that you attend a field orientation. Um, that'll be in August, right before you start field. And the whole point is around issues of preparedness, making sure that you have the essential information that you'll need before you go into your field experience, uh, before you begin your internship, and also to just have an opportunity to meet with some other students who are also going into field, build some cohesion um, with colleagues, especially since so much of what we're doing right now is online. Um, it's just another opportunity to meet other students and also to meet with the field uh, faculty who are going to be working with you during your field education experience. So um, when you join our program, I'm gonna be positive here and assume that you will. When you come on board, you will be getting an email um, with information about the specifics on the dates of when those orientations take place and when you should plan on it. I think one thing that's always a good idea is, you know, it's, it's, it's great to think about taking vacation right before you start your program. I get it. I totally get it. If you do that, do it in the beginning of August. Don't wait until the week before classes start or even the week you know, towards the end of August because you don't wanna miss out on the opportunity to get your field orientation, okay? So just wanted to put a plug in there for that. All right, um, foundation field education. Most of the folks who come into our program come in at the foundation or the first year. And it's a two-year program if you're full-time. And so essentially what that means is there are differences between your first year of field placement and your second year of field placement. There are two years. Your first year field placement is very intentionally a generalist social work experience. It's meant to give you an idea of what social work even is, um, all the different various ways that it can be practiced, uh, get you oriented to some beginning skills in being a social worker, as well as beginning clinical skills, if you intend to be a clinical social worker, as well as an understanding of research and policy um, if you intend to be a macro practitioner. Um, and so it gives you just a really nice foundation and baseline from which to start your progression towards becoming a social work professional. Um, when you do your application, it will be assigned to one of our field coordinators and that assignment will happen by region. So again, if, you, if you're on with us today and you know you're from Frederick, Maryland, and you submit your field application, it will most likely be assigned to Denise Chop 
or if you're part of our Shady Grove program, it'll be assigned to one of our Shady Grove coordinators, probably Barbara Nathanson. Um, and then the other thing that I think is just a good kind of basic thing to know about foundation field education is you will be in field two days a week. And we reserve chunks of time on Monday and Wednesdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays for scheduling purposes. That will enable you to know what days you'll be expected to be in field and then what days then you will need to register for the other courses that you'll need to have on board in order to fully engage in our concurrent model of classroom instruction and field education. Another thing that's part of the field uh, foundation field education experience that's different from the advanced year is the foundation year has a field seminar. And that seminar happens online only once a month for 90 minutes, but it's a critical part of the experience. And it's a critical part of the experience for two primary reasons. One is seminar serves as the function that is a bridge between the content that you get from the classroom, all these great theories that you learn and techniques and things, intervention strategies. It's all really great when you learn it in the four walls of a classroom, but you're gonna to need to learn how to actually use that material in your field placement. Seminar is there to help facilitate that process because what you learn in a controlled environment of a classroom or through a role play is inevitably gonna look very different than the work you do with an actual client in, in an agency in real life. And so seminar is an opportunity for you and nine other students to come together on a regular basis, get to know each other, learn to trust each other and work on those transitions and interpretations and that integration together. So that's the first thing. It's also a course that is supervised by a practicing social worker, someone who has a lot of experience as a practicing social worker and can guide you through some of the challenges that you may face or celebrate with you some of the successes that you have as you learn how to work with your clients. The other really critical important piece of our seminar is we have a very intentional cultural humility component. We believe very strongly that it is impossible to become a social worker without acknowledging the reality of structural oppression and the critical importance of being an anti-oppressive social worker. And because of that, we have three very specific models that are infused into the curriculum of our seminar that encourage every student to recognize the realities of privilege and oppression and how all of that rolls out in a variety of isms and biases out there, uh, out there um, that our clients encounter and that we encounter. Um, and, and because of this, um, it really brings to the surface the implicit curriculum throughout the entire program. And that is that self-awareness piece, that critical self-reflection piece, that piece where you learn more about how you walk through the world, how you see the world and what your values are and how those things have a direct impact on the way that you interact with other people. And especially if you're working with people from vulnerable populations, they may also be from marginalized populations. And so what does their experience mean? Um, what's important to that? Now, if you've been to a general information session, you've heard about the social work practice um, and the structural oppression course. Um, and so that is also a mandatory course that you'll be taking. Seminar is meant to help you integrate some of the things you learn from that course, the things you learn from all of your other courses, um, and what you begin to learn about yourself as you start practicing as a social worker in the real world. And so that's also a really important part of foundation field education. And at some point we hope it'll get to advanced field education. Um, when you get to advanced, just very briefly, you'll be in field either three days a week as a full-time regular student, or we also have an option to be an extended student where you'd continue in field for two days a week. It would just be for a longer period of time. There is more time required of the advanced field practicum experience than the foundation field practicum experience. Um, the foundation field practicum experience is about 55 days 
uh, the advanced field practicum experience is about 80 days. And so the, the differences are pretty significant. And the reason why is that in the advanced year, you're working on selecting a specific area of practice, whether it's a population or type of practice. Um, you're also thinking about whether or not you want to be clinical or macro and, and you know, what those things mean. Um, and then within clinical or macro, there are certain specializations that you may want to focus on. If you want to work with an aging population, if you want to become a therapist and practice behavioral health, there's also um, families and children, um, health, being a health-based social worker, and then organizational leadership. So I'm going to pause for just a second because I know that um, my friend Angela is going to have to take off in a few minutes. And because she is our macro guru, I want to invite Angela to share just a little bit about what macro social work even is, what it looks like, um, and things to be thinking about as you enter your foundation year and might be thinking about macro practice. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, so glad to be here. It's always nice to talk with people who are considering social work and considering our program. I'll also put my email address in the chat before I jump off. Um, so if folks have other questions that we don't get to and you have, want to talk more about macro, you can just reach out to me via email. Um, so macro social work. This is an area of social work that some people don't even realize is an option or is an area of social work. Many people come to the School of Social Work, ours and others, with uh, intention to practice therapy, to be involved in behavioral health, to be involved in direct client service. But there's this whole other area of social work, which we call at our school macro social work, which is really the practice of social work with systems. So instead of having an individual client, um, a family, a, a child, an adult that you're working with, you might be working with an entire community or an entire system or an entire population or an entire neighborhood. And so in your foundation year, um, you're required to take a class, which is um, Social Work 631, which is our class with communities and organization, which oftentimes is people's first exposure to the concept of, of macro social work. And in that, you'll learn about um, policy work, kind of policy with a big P, which could be policy advocacy or what we consider policy with a little P, policy implementation. You'll learn about community organizing strategies and what it looks like to do grassroots organizing or grass tops organizing. And then you'll also get exposure to program administration and the whole area of social work, which is involved in sort of assessment of needs for communities creation of program, management of program, evaluation of program. And so it's all these areas of social work, which are still your skills around engaging and intervening and assessing, but you're doing it at that systems level. And so oftentimes I'll talk to students who came to our school with that intention to be a therapist or be a clinician, and then they get exposed in their foundation placement, because as Laura said, foundation year should be a generalist placement where you have some opportunity for direct client work and some opportunity for macro or systems level work. So maybe you get exposed to it in that field placement, or maybe you get exposed to it in that 631 class, but then folks realize, hey, there's maybe I am a systems thinker. Maybe I am more interested in the policy side of things or the management of a program. And if that does speak to you, if that's where you, you find your passion to be, then those are the, the people that I work with in the macro concentration. And macro field placements um, exist in a variety of settings with a variety of populations. You know, just because you're macro doesn't mean uh, that you don't work with people because after all, it is still social work. So nothing happens in social work without the involvement, the engagement, the communication with people. Uh, so there are lots of exciting things, lots of exciting placements, lots of things to consider that you may never even known were options, um, but they're out there and they exist. And so, like I said, I'll put my um, contact information in the chat. I can hang out for about 15 more minutes. Happy to answer questions folks have either here in this session or via email, um, but excited to, to see some names and some faces and, and hopefully we'll be welcoming you to the school in September. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Angela, appreciate that. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to Angela, whether it's tonight or at some point down the road. Um, I, she's such a strong advocate for macro practice. And the reality is, you know, we talk about 
social work practice in these silos of micro and macro or clinical and macro. And the reality is they're not that siloed. Um, even if you were to choose macro practice, you'll find yourself using clinical skills in some of the work that you do, especially if you end up doing community organizing um, or even within organizations, you'll find yourself um, using clinical skills to help people just get along with each other. Um, Lord knows we could use more clinical skills in Congress right now to help them get along. Um, but I would say that a congressional placement is more likely to be a macro placement. So those are some of the things to be thinking about. And then on the other end, even if you're a clinical social worker, knowing um, the policies that have direct impact on your clients is gonna be really important. So all of it is just one big picture. And we try very hard, at least in field education. And I think you'll find as you go through the different courses in our program, that there's a lot of inter intermixing and inter intermingling between macro and clinical. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel, don't get yourself too siloed in your thinking. And especially in the foundation year, I really encourage you to just keep yourself open to the different ex things that you have to experience and keep asking those questions. Um, so the next step I'm gonna just skim over pretty quickly. Um, and this is basically what is the field application process? So I mentioned earlier, you wanna go on to our um, website. I'll show you exactly how to get to the application, complete your application and submit that application as soon as possible. Um, once you've done that and you submit it, then we have a process where we will receive every application and it gets assigned to an individual coordinator based on where you live. And then that person is going to be reading your application and thinking about what agencies are available to receive students. And the process for that is a matching process. It isn't just kind of, you know, pin the tail on the donkey, oh, let's send this person here. It's a thoughtful process. It involves reading the content of your resume that's part of the application, the content of two narratives we ask you to write that's part of your application, um, and just what would make for a really strong, solid first year experience as a social worker. And I think if you find that you have any particular interests or anything that you're really curious about, or maybe a population that you never could imagine working with, reach out to your field, your field coordinator and talk with them. Share those questions, have those conversations, because I think your field coordinator is going to be best positioned to talk with you about those things, those interests, um, and then work with you on your placement experience to try to, to try to find opportunities for you to actually get exposure to work with that particular population or in that particular realm of social work. So I think that's a really important thing for you all to notice. And that's also a really important part of how we view the field placement process. It's a partnership. Now in the first year, you have to rely on your coordinator and their knowledge and expertise of the agencies that we have partnerships with. We partner with almost 400 agencies throughout the state. And so your coordinator is gonna have the most knowledge of what those agencies are, what they do, who they serve, and so you have to rely on your coordinator for that level of expertise. What your, for, what your coordinator is going to be relying on you for is a well-written, um, is, is an updated resume, two well-written narratives, and narratives that share enough about you in response to those questions to give your prospective instructor in the field information about who you are, what you've done, what brings you to social work, um, and what do you have to offer an agency as a first year student? And that may be something from previous experience that you've had that you're going to bring forward. We also know there are a lot of people who come into our program who have had personal experiences with social workers. And what a wonderful thing to have you want to pay it forward by becoming a social worker yourself. If that is part of your story, I think that's wonderful. We all really appreciate that. And what we would encourage you to do as well as if you choose to write about whatever those things are in your narratives, that you keep in mind that those narratives are gonna to go to a future field instructor um, and that you approach interviewing with that agency and that field instructor from a professional perspective. And so we would just caution you to not exercise too much self-disclosure 
so that you don't inadvertently overexpose yourself avoidably and therefore feel uncomfortable about it for any reason um, or uh, you know, cause your prospective field instructor to have any concern whatsoever about your preparedness and readiness to work with people and have it be about their experiences and not too much about your own. So those are some of the things you'll learn more, or get more about when you become a student in our program. It's also something that's really important to keep in mind when you complete your field application. It's kind of like a job application. So you wanna be thinking about what the process would be for you in applying for a job, uh, everything from your application to how you prepare for and participate in the interview with the agency because you will be interviewing in those agencies and then any necessary research you'd wanna do as part of your referral for that interview about the agency. Um, once you have that interview, we assume that it will go really, really well. Most of the time it does. And when it does, then you share that information back with your coordinator and the agency will do the same. And then we make it official. You're matched with that agency and that's where you'll conduct your placement moving forward. If it's not successful for whatever reason, and there's a broad array of reasons for why it might not be successful, that many of which are completely beyond any student's control. If that's the case, then you bring that information back to your coordinator. The agency does the same, and we look for another agency to send your application to, and we try again. Um, just like in the job seeking process, you may apply for several jobs, but you land in just one. And that's the premise that we take going into the application process for field education. Another thing to keep in mind of is it, because of the professional environment, most agencies do require a criminal background check. Many agencies also require drug screening. These are things that are all part of onboarding processes. I know many family and children's agencies also require um, a child background check and making sure that you have all the appropriate clearances there. So it's something to keep in mind and be prepared for should the particular agency where you're uh, being referred require it. Um, there are also different kinds of placements. Okay, so we're not talking about just the agency that may be down the street from you that you've seen. Um, there are other placement options for you to keep in mind. Um, so in addition to the agency down the street or the agency within the community that could be a possibility for you, we have many students who come to our program who might already be working in social services. And one of the benefits that we have from COVID is that students who are currently working in social services may be able to use their employment as their field placement. And this is a really great thing because most students need to work. People have bills to pay. You've got rent you've got to cover. You have other people in your family to take care of, for example. And so having an employment-based option, I think, is really great for a couple of reasons. One is because of all those realities, and it's a lot to juggle school, work, and family obligations. Two, it also means that there is a nod of respect for you for already being employed in social services agency and embracing um, the work that you're already doing there. The, the important thing to remember is that if this is a situation that could apply to you, we need to make sure that we carefully screen um, your agency and the work you do there and make sure that it's aligned with the competency areas that you're gonna need to be learning as part of your field experience. So just like our courses are very intentionally guided in terms of what you need to do in those courses to learn, field education is the same way. So we would wanna make sure that the experience that you would have at your agency is going to give you all the necessary learning opportunities you will need that are required of a foundation student. And once that part is done, then you might be able to proceed with an employment-based placement. Or we may find that it's not gonna give you all those opportunities, in which case you would be shortchanging yourself if you attempted to proceed in an employment-based environment. So there is a screening and proposal process for employment-based placements. We're happy to answer any additional questions about that. Um, but if that's something that's on your radar screen, um, the, the field application actually does have an area where you would complete the screening 
And then once you engage with your coordinator, you could also you would also move forward and complete a proposal if we determine that the opportunities are right. Okay. We also have faculty field placements, and these are centers within the School of Social Work that work within the community where we reside. So there are the Promise Heights programs, the SWACOS program, which stands for Social Work Community Outreach Services, and then there's the Title IV-E program. Um, Promise Heights and SWACOS work mostly with, directly with the communities um, that are closest to our campus in Baltimore. Um, they offer opportunities in schools, they offer opportunities in community libraries, and they're very, very involved um, with communities that are directly related to and, and near uh, the School of Social Work. The Title IV-E program is actually a state-based program that involves um, providing services to families and children in departments of social services throughout the state. Um, the wonderful thing about the Title IV-E program and the Promise Heights programs is they both also offer stipends. And stipends, when you're a student and you know you're trying to make ends meet, can be a very welcome thing in addition to the very specific learning opportunities that will be made available to you in those programs. There are also the BWISE fellowships and BWISE are behavioral health workforce development grants that center mostly around behavioral health with regard to mental health, substance abuse, and health. And those three interventions interconnect in the BWISE fellowships. So there are a number of fellowships. There are a couple of slides that I'm gonna move through pretty quickly because I wanna leave time for your questions. But I would encourage you to go onto our website and go to the BWISE fellowships link to take a look at those different fellowship offerings. They are generous. There are a couple that are only available to advanced students, but you would apply for them midway through the foundation year when you start thinking about your advanced year placement. Um, so if you think you have an interest in doing uh, behavioral health intervention and substance abuse intervention, definitely check out the BWISE fellowships. There's one that is actually a state-based fellowship that is a two-year program. Um, it's called SUDIF. And it offers opportunities in substance use disorder treatment. Um, and in, even though it's a two-year program, you would still do the, the generalist foundation placement. But then in your advanced year, you would go to a much more finite list of placements that really are about substance abuse treatment. And then you would be paid a stipend in exchange for this specialized training. And you would be paid a stipend for two years. The other, some of the other BWISE fellowships pay a generous stipend for one year in the advanced year, but it is a general, it's a very generous stipend. I believe it's $10,000 for the advanced year. And then the, the SUDIF is $28,000 for both years. And that is in exchange for the specialized training and the commitment to populate the workforce after you graduate. So you would need to commit to working within the substance abuse field and behavioral health field for a couple of years after graduation. Um, this is a little more information on those grants specifically. Again, I think rather than going through it tonight, what I would prefer is that you write down the email addresses that you see um, and go to the BWISE page of our website. You can just type B-H-W-I-S-E in the search on the School of Social Work website and that will take you directly to their page and you can read more detail about each one of the grants and contact the folks whose names you see here um, with regard to the different programs. Some of you could still apply for a couple of the grants. The advanced only grants are already done. They've made their selections, but there are two opportunities, both the Sudwe and the SUDIF fellowships that you could still apply for. Those applications are due on March 15th. So if you think this is something that would be of interest to you, I strongly encourage you to get the information so that you can meet that application deadline. And that also doesn't preclude you doing the application for field, it complements it. Once you're accepted into one of those programs, then that will direct where you end up going in field. So sorry to be moving through it so quickly, but again, I wanna make sure that we get to your questions. I've promised a couple of times I showed you, I would show you how to get to the field application, okay? So 
here's a snapshot of what our um, uh, web page looks like. You go to the University of Maryland School of Social Work web page, and you'll see academics. You want to click on that, and then you want to click on field education. Once you do that, you'll see the field education face page. And in order to do your application, you're going to click on electronic field notebook. Once you click on that, you're going to make sure you click on current students. And then you'll be directed to actually do your application. If you have any questions about this at all, please reach out to our office. We're more than happy to walk you through it. There are also some other resources. If you have any additional questions, we do have a frequently asked questions cheat sheet on our webpage. And I put the link here for you. Also happy to make sure that this PowerPoint presentation is shared with you so you have this information and all the links it contains. Um, make sure that if you do your field application that you have a conversation with your coordinator. Talk to that person about any concerns um, that you may have about field or any questions. If you have no idea who to contact, you can't remember who your coordinator is, then reach out to our main mailbox with your questions or call and leave us a voice message and we will get back to you to try to answer any questions you have. So that's all I have. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can open up the chat and see if anyone has any specific questions or just feel free to unmute and put your questions out there if you have them. Hi, Laura, Janice Eisenberg here. Um, thank you so much for this incredibly informative presentation. Sure. Um, one, one question that I have is for those of us who are applying for the part-time program, does our field placement start in the first year or would it start in the second year? Or rather, which, which semester would that start in? Your field placement will typically start in the fall semester, but depending on what type of part-time student you are, you probably would begin your foundation field placement in your second year, and then you would do your advanced field placement in the third year. There's also a four-year part-time program. So I would say if you are thinking about coming on board part-time, the name Nakia Sherman is going to be a really great name for you. Poor Nakia, I send everybody to her because she's so wonderful and she knows her stuff so well. What Nakia will do, she's our academic advisor and what she'll do is she'll sit down with you and say, okay, are we talking about a part-time three-year program or a part-time four-year program? And she will work out with you your plan of study so you'll know exactly what you need to take and when. With regard to field education, most likely you'll do some coursework first in the first year and then you'll begin field in the second year. Great, thank you. Sure. And we do have a question in the chat. Um, it says, is Title for e only available for full-time students? Denise, do you wanna take that one? Cause I know you know Title IV e very, very well. Yes, thank you, Lara. Um, yes, please know Title IV e, um, is only available to full-time students. And basically what that means is that when you are in the Title IV e program and you're in field, you essentially are a full-time student when you're in field. Um, because field takes the two full days a week and we have a concurrent model for your foundation year, you will take field and then you will be taking at least two other courses along with your field placement in the fall. And then in the spring, you'll be taking field plus at least one other course in order to meet the requirements of the concurrent model. And all of that put together, and I'm looking at Dean White's box because I see her nodding her head, so I'm glad I'm, I'm sharing this correctly. But basically what it means is that you will be putting in enough time with enough credits that you'll be considered a full-time student while you're in field. So Dean White, I don't know if there's anything that you would wanna to add to that to make it as clear as, as possible or if that's okay. No, because um, just adding on, so when we're talking about full-time, um, when it's your foundation year, because you have two practice classes that go along with your field, um, it, nine credits at a graduate level automatically makes you a full-time student. 
So this is across the United States and probably some international um, universities as well. Nine credits for a graduate level program is a full-time load. So um, anytime that you have nine credits or more, you are a full-time student. Um, but in regards to Title IV-E, because your foundation, you, you, you have to have your field with your practice classes. So you can't just like take the field and do not have classes. Um, so field and basically either foundation would be practice classes and advanced year would be your method classes, depending on if you're clinical or macro, um, but they come together, they're a pair. So either way, you'll be a full-time student in a Title IV-E program. Same thing with behavior, um, BY's um, program as well, full-time student. Thank you, Dean White. And I think too that, you know, like I said, with the BY's programs, Title IV-E also has their own webpage. Um, and so if you have specific questions, um, then I would also encourage you to go to the School of Social Work webpage and just search for title IV-E for E uh, with the Roman numerals. Um, and it'll give you more detailed information about the application process and the necessary orientations and requirements. There's a solid one full week orientation for 4E because it's highly specialized training in child welfare and everything involved with child welfare and the specific intervention modes, uh, modes and, and strategies that are most effective in doing work in child welfare. So motivational interviewing, for example, is a huge part of your training as a Title IV-E participant. So I'd strongly encourage you to check that out. The other great thing about Title IV-E is you're getting direct training that puts you in line with a job in child welfare in a Department of Social Service, and that makes it invaluable. So um, Denise has dropped uh, the director's name for Title IV and his email address in the chat. Definitely reach out to Chris. Denise is also very knowledgeable about it. Um, and it's a great program if you can see yourself as being a child welfare warrior at some point in the near future. Any other questions that you all have? Hi. Hi. Um, Thank you so much for sharing all that information. A question that I had in regards to field placement is what has the experience been um, in the pandemic with everything being virtual? Can you um, expand on that a little bit more, please? Sure, absolutely. You know, I, I have to, let me just start out by saying how much I admire our students who have been getting their MSW during the pandemic because it's been a real challenge. I'll be real with you. Um, Many agencies um, were either fully remote or partially remote in some kind of hybrid fashion. Um, and it's also worn different faces throughout these two years of the pandemic. So in the very beginning, for example, as a university, we made the decision that all of our students across the campus, whether they were law students, medical students, or social work students, or more, we thought, you know what, it's just not safe. We need to pull everybody out. So we did that, we had to facilitate that extraction pretty rapidly in a really quick shift to make sure that we didn't do harm to our agency partnerships, but also um, made sure that we were keeping our students safe. And so we started that way. Then we went into that following academic year, um, fully remote in the classroom, there were some agencies though that had developed the capacity and put safety measures in place to be in person. And so what we did was we had all of our agencies who thought that they would have some in-person involvement write up a safety proposal so that we knew exactly what precautions they were gonna be taking with regard to having anyone there in person. What are their COVID protocols? Are they gonna be testing? Will they require mask wearing, et cetera? And this was all before the vaccine was out. So we had those in-person proposals done so that we would know what each agency was planning if they planned to have students in person. And then students who were referred to those agencies were told this will be an in-person placement and then given the option with that information if they could not tolerate an in-person environment for whatever reason. Um, there is um, on campus, an exemption practice where you can get a medical or religious exemption for vaccination. 
Um, that is effective for the university and the classroom environment, but it does not apply to agencies. The university doesn't govern agencies in that way. So again, it, mean, it meant that we had to be very reliant on those in-person proposals that we had every agency renew for each year that we've been in the pandemic so that we knew exactly what their safety protocols would be and what their capacity was for having students and having students in what way. Because we also found that, you know, gotta love social workers, there's a lot of resilience out there. And what agencies were faced with was how do we continue to provide services in a pandemic? Many of them brought telehealth on board and, and provided teleworking opportunities to their employees that they extended to students as well. They also had hybrid models where um, maybe students would come in and work within an office setting with fellow employees, but they would still use telehealth to reach out to clients who are still at home and, and work through telehealth um, platforms in order to provide services remotely. Um, that was one hybrid version. Another hybrid version would be just cutting back, reducing the time of risk exposure so that if students were expected to be in field two days a week, they might be in person on one day and then remote another day. So it would reduce the overall risk exposure that students were in. One thing that we had to be really realistic about was that one, we couldn't control agency policies and the choices that agencies made about how they were gonna serve their clients. All we could do was share that information with students and do our best to make sure that they had safety plans in place. The other thing is that we couldn't, um, have agencies require or not require vaccination. That was also entirely up to them. Our campus requires vaccination in order to be in place, but um, agencies may or may not require vaccination. That's up to them. But whether or not a student's vaccination status matches with an agency vaccination status would be part of that matching process. And if an agency requires vaccination and a student is unvaccinated, there would have to be an exemption process through the agency in order for that to work, or there would need to be a remote option in order for that to work. Um, one thing that I, I'll just be really honest with you, one thing that we really can't do is if you do not have your vaccine and most agencies require it, we cannot guarantee that we could find a placement opportunity for you that wouldn't require vaccination. And it's just a reality of the limits of our capacity. Um, and so we strongly encourage students to seek out vaccinations so that you can have as many opportunities as possible. If for whatever reason you're in a situation where you are not vaccinated and you cannot be vaccinated for any reason, get your application in as soon as possible and be absolutely transparent about that. We will do our best. We can't make any guarantees, but we'll certainly do our best. What we're hoping for, and I think we all are hoping for this at this point, is that COVID and any new variations will continue to get weaker and weaker as we get stronger and stronger in our ability to adapt and live within this new environment. And so, you know, it's, it's always, it's kind of constantly shifting. Our agencies are developing new capacities. They're developing new abilities to find ways of working with people who need services. As much as the university is also adapting and having to constantly change and, and be um, able to do the very best we can in the environment that we're in. Right now, um, we're all working remotely until February 7th, hoping that the Omicron variant will back off a little bit and let us try to at least get back to some semblance of in-person. But even when we're in person, we have a mask mandate and we have a distancing mandate. So if you know Denise's office, for example, is right next to mine, Denise and I have to have our masks on if we're talking to each other and we're within proximity of each other. So you know all of these precautions are in place for safety for everyone. Um, and at the same time, we recognize that everyone makes their own decisions about vaccination or not, and they have their very personal reasons for doing so. And we have to be very aware of the implications of that when it comes to the limits of our capacity to try to serve everyone and make everyone happy. 
What I can guarantee is we will work as hard as we possibly can and do everything we possibly can within our limits to find every student a placement. And we're very fortunate that as hard as it's been, because many agencies in the beginning said, we cannot even think about having a student right now. We've got way too much on our plates. Um, we still were able to place every student. Um, we also had to develop some alternative learning activities that students could do remotely because we couldn't place every student immediately. That's gotten better this year. We anticipate that'll get even better next year so that it will be as close to normal, whatever that is now, but normal pre-COVID that we would pretty much have every student placed before that first day of field. Um, we certainly are going to continue to strive for that and have every hope and expectation we'll be able to do that. I hope that answers your question. It's been a rough road, I'll be honest with you. It's, uh, you perfectly answered my question. Thank you so much. Great. Any other questions? Am I missing anything in the chat? Anything that my colleagues feel I might have left out before we wrap up tonight? I mean, at the end of the day, I would just say, this isn't the only time for you to ask questions about field. Our door is open. Um, as I said, um, I, I'll work very closely with Venetia to make sure that you get all the contacts, information and links and so on that were in the presentation that I used tonight. So that when you think of future questions, because you probably will, you can reach out, our door is open. We invite you to please ask us the questions. I would rather have you ask and be able to provide an answer to you and have you be informed as you continue on your path. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to my colleagues for making the time to be here tonight. Um, and our doors open, we, we hope to see you. Um, stop by and come join our program. We hope to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night.